All right, Luca Nation. This has kind of been a, a series in the making. So 10 for 10, we launched it after National, and people loved it. And I've wanted to bring back 10 for 10 in Cage as well. Uh, that was, like you said, you know, featuring the women of the hobby, right? We just went to Mint, or you and Manny did. I missed it. I apologize. <laughs> but that show had more women building businesses, creating channels, helping grow the hobby than we've ever seen, in my opinion. And we wanted to kind of launch on the back of that a 10 for 10 series where we share the stories and learn the stories of other women doing amazing things in space. So I'm really looking forward to, one, getting to know the people in the hobby, the women in the hobby, but two, kind of creating or providing a platform for you that you could also learn these stories. And maybe someone out there, you know, 18 years old, graduating college, she creates a channel, you know, creates a YouTube page, a YouTube channel. So there's a lot of different ways this could go. This is the first episode. Uh, Hannah, she collects. You guys all know her, big F1 fan. So to kick the series off, we wanted to have her on the show. And I, I'm very, very excited to kind of hear your story, learn more about you. Uh, so Hannah, welcome to the show. It's an absolute honor, uh, guys, for having me. Um, I'm very excited to and honored to kick off this series. Hopefully there's a lot more, um, you know, successful and more inspirational women to come on, on the show. But yeah, very excited to be here. We couldn't think how of a better way to start it off than she collects cards. I mean, how do you just, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you beat that? So, I mean, we love it. It's a, it's a great inaugural, you know, guest number one. And as Andrew asked, what do you think of Mint? It was, it was absolutely insane. I mean, they kind of um, phrased it as it's more than a show and it absolutely was more than a show. It definitely felt more like a corporate America uh, networking event, not going to lie. And they put on an, an amazing, you know, technology based show and a lot of the industry leaders being there. And also, um, you know, for a plug, a lot of them being women, which was incredible. I mean, the whole thing was hosted and planned out by men and women. Um, I think more women, actually, like Ty and, and Christina being spear, spearheading a lot of the efforts. Like that was incredible. Um, so I hope they do it again soon. I can't wait for the next one. Well, I think she, she you... hit on the nail on the head here, Andrew, right? I've been singing the praises of it for a week, saying it's the best show, <laughs> saying how it takes shows to the next level, saying how it was clean, <laughs> saying how it's the new, <laughs> you know, raise the bar, and now we figured out why. It's all yeah. it's all the women. <laughs> it's all the women who threw it. I and, can't I mean, take credit right. for I mean, it, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, I mean, it really is. We've been we've been saying that too, from Christina's PC to you know to Louise. And, uh, you know, everybody in between. So, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that's the secret. I hope you're listening, National. <laughs> I hope you're listening, yes. National. They are. Yes. They follow me. So they all listen. <laughs> Go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. Hannah, how'd you, how'd you, no, how'd you find yourself in the hobby? You know, like, what's your collecting journey? Were you collecting uh, as a young kid? Did you just find yourself, you know, collecting a year ago? And we're like, this is awesome. This is fun. How do you, what's your journey yeah. into the hobby? Yeah, it, uh, I definitely wasn't exposed to it growing up. I actually didn't grow up in the States, so I think that's probably a big reason why. Um, but I found myself here about two and a half years ago, um, just right before the pandemic when Kobe passed away. I was looking for a collectible of his to, to get into, so not long ago. Uh, but always been uh, a, you know, an avid sort of uh, you know, investor or you know, like just enthusiast in like alternative assets, um, you know, even back then. And so I saw an opportunity to marry my passion for sports, which, you know, like I played sports growing up, basketball, tennis, um, et cetera. Um, didn't play in college, but, you know, played in high school and middle school. So marrying that and uh, um, like collecting and then you know, even seeing some appreciation and value really like just hit home for me. Cage, where were you when Kobe passed? So I'll tell you real quick where I was. I was at a grocery store. And this was maybe one month into my journey back into sports cards. And on that day, I actually, the day before, I got a Jordan Fleer delivered in the mail. I bought it off Mercari. And it was what? like, this is like the biggest purchase I ever made. It was like 600 bucks. Uh, it ended up being a fake Jordan Fleer. But someone texted me and they were like, Kobe passed. And I, I, I was shocked. I thought it was the biggest hoax, the biggest joke I've ever seen. I was like, dude, yeah. this isn't funny. Like, well, why would you send that to me? Yeah. So. And then I went home immediately Where was I? and I started, mm -hmm. I started looking for Kobe cards. That's what I did. Exactly. I was on eBay as soon as it oh. happened. I bought 78 different Kobe autographs from small ones up to eminence. Uh, and then the, uh, the, you know, the night uh, that it happened and my son was actually pretty upset by it. 
I messaged everyone who I bought the, uh, the, the autos from and said, listen, kind of feeling bad about being such a ghoul here. So feel free to cancel this and sell mm. it for more or take it down. Cause these are all people who had it up and probably didn't know. Yeah. And every single one of the 78 that I bought canceled the purchase. Not a surprise, <laughs> I guess. Not, not a surprise, but I wrote every single yeah. one of them. Yeah. So I, yeah. I wound up buying, you know, a week later, you know, one Kobe auto for each of my kids. Um, I was just, I was in my living room here, you know, it popped on the, you know, the family kind of huddled around the TV in disbelief. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah, that was, it was, it's pretty nuts. I mean, I had been back in collecting for a while, Andrew, mm. but, you know, before right. that happened. Uh, but I was not a Kobe guy, you know, um, mm. you know, when Kobe came in the league, I was already, you know, almost out of college. Um, you know, I was at that, that phase that, you know, we've had enough people on to, to talk about where, um, you know, collecting had kind of stopped, you know, right. the, con- <clears throat> the contents of a keg kind of took over as what I collected, uh, instead of cards, and uh, you know, I was heading towards law school, so I never became a Kobe guy. Shaq before that, you know, Michael Jordan, sure, but Kobe was kind of in that that phase where I was uh, not not collecting. Got it. So. Hannah, what did you what did you scoop? What what was your first? What did you buy any Kobe memorabilia or cards or autos that day? Yeah, so you know, like I've been calling myself a Kobe fan, and I, I, you know, I don't know him. He doesn't know me personally or anything like that. But I felt like he had a huge influence in my life. Like even in, you know, grad school when I'm like so tired, I'm like Mamba mentality. Like you gotta like you know crunch through like through the nights. You know, give more. You know, if you if you feel like you can't give more, just keep giving more. So I was really distraught. In the first place, I went actually StockX to look for some Kobe shoes some basketball shoes, but they were flying up to like two, $3,000. And at the time I was like, that's ridiculous. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. um, a friend of mine who's been in the hobby for about a year by then had, had just sent me an eBay link uh, to his 96 tops rookie card PSA nine. So I bought three of those. They were $200 each at the time. And then two weeks later, you know, they all jumped to, I think 600 each and uh, the rest is history from there. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing, right? That first hit. It's like, uh, shoes. Yeah. It's going to it's like going to a casino, right? You know, and you're chasing yeah. that the whole rest of the time, especially because the market is very different than where it was, you know, back then. Correct. Andrew will tell you his story about coming in with Zion cards and winning on that and chasing that ever since. Wow. It's the same kind of rush you get from you know, your first hit of Coke, Andrew will tell you about that. Also, it's the same, you know, like gambling, you know, when you win big on a bet. Um, Cage, Hannah you know, doesn't know our show chasing. like that. She doesn't know our show. She doesn't know when you're joking like that. Well, you know, then she'll be afraid of you and think, oh, my God, I'm on with a cokehead. You know, I mean, that works, too. You know, I mean, it is what it I'm is. literally on with a cokehead. Do you have your I'm not judging. You? <laughs> I'm not judging. I do. It's right here. It's right there. I got exactly. it. I, got it. I, don't go, exactly. I don't go anywhere without my coke. Well, let's talk about women, women of the hobby, right? You, you and Sam started that up. When did that start up? Um, so Sam Shufford, um, founded it, um, I want to say late 2020 or early 2021. So we, we've been like just about a year now. Um, Sam started it and as she was kind of starting the, the, the platform, she reached out sort of just asking like, Hey, I, and at that time, you know, really there weren't actually that many, uh, publicly known female collectors. I mean, it's crazy to say that even a year and a half ago, it wasn't normal to see, you know, as many, I mean, I was getting, dude, me, like, what's up, man? Like when I was doing deals uh, on, on digital <laughs> platforms, like all the time. So she reached out saying like, Hey, I actually, you know, like follow you and think that we need more voice in, uh, in the hobby, you know, from a female perspective. Um, could you kind of like help me like maybe, you know, talk about or share with her like things that I've experienced or whatever. And I was like, you know, actually what you're, doing is like absolutely incredible and i think we can do something with it like and let's run this together right so it went from hey like can you give some some advice or guidance to hey actually i i don't think i'm in a position to guide you with anything like but let's run this together and like make those mistakes together make those improvements together and it's been a huge blast um you know needless to say um and you know it's it's women of the hobby is a public open uh group uh community you could be a male and technically join, and we have amazing male supporters, um, you know, who uh, donates with waxes if they're shop owners who want us to like just open it and, and donate to other female collectors or kids. Um, we have other folks who just like genuinely are, are advocates for us. 
Um, but yeah, it's a public group. We've grown extremely, uh, you know, in, in large, uh, you know, percentage. At the national, I think we were for our meetup. There was about 25, 30 uh, women <clears throat> that we met together last August. This past mint, I think there were at least 60, 70 of us that could make it out. So doubled uh, in size. And there's also a, a Facebook group that uh, Sarah Layton and some of the other folks uh, help lead. And in that group, we have about 200 very active uh, women collectors who collect both women and male uh, sports cards. So it's a, it's a growing group and we absolutely love it. And it's what's really cool is a lot of the women in the group are leaders in the industry. And so the amount of just knowledge, history lessons, and and just, you know, real time sort of, you know, guidance that we get from those conversation, I think is sweeter and more beneficial than any other group that I'm part of. Um, so, um, you know, and we watch out for each other, uh, you know, in whatever ways possible. So it's, it's been a blast and anyone is welcome to join. How did you get into F1 <laughs> and educate the audience on F1 too? Because it, it, it feels like it's come from nowhere, right? It feels like it all derived from that Netflix documentary. And yeah. you are a big believer in F1. You talk about F1, but you back it up with a lot of facts. So I said kind of like a selfish question because I don't want to miss the boat on F1. And I wanted to use this interview, yes, to showcase and, and inspire women, but also learn about a new space that you know really well, and, and maybe our audience doesn't know as well. And yeah. I don't know it for, I don't know it at all. So I'm going to shut right. up and listen. I really don't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't call myself an expert of F1, but I've been a huge fan of F1 for a long time. Um, my husband and I actually, we met in Austin, Texas, and we you know, used to go to the racetrack, the first, uh, you know, U.S. racetrack most, uh, in the modern days, um, opened up, I believe, back in 2011 or 2012. And back then, tickets were extremely cheap. Nobody wanted to go to Formula One races. So we've always been into it. I wouldn't say, like, I watched every race every weekend, but we would definitely catch up on highlights. Um, Drive to Survive on Netflix definitely was a catalyst in the growth of Formula One in the U.S. specifically. So uh, North America is a market that Formula One has been trying to crack for many, many decades. But um, because of, and this is my opinion, because of the already pre-existing uh, sports, you know, like football, baseball, and basketball, and sort of that attraction to that. I don't think there was ever room for emerging sport to take a big uh, chunk of it, especially when you don't have U.S. drivers uh, who's driving on Formula One, right? At least big ones. But when you kind of, you know, go up a little bit to a, a, like a 10,000 square feet level and look at the global sort of presence of Formula One, it's mainly, uh, you know, like sort of, uh, followed after in the Middle East, you know, Europe, and some Asian countries as well. But when you think about those uh, places that F1 takes, um, you know, their crew to and, and race on, it is the top 0.0001%, uh, you know, places in the world. They don't race in, you know, Los Angeles. They don't race in like Atlanta, Georgia. They race in Monaco. They race in Singapore. They race in Abu Dhabi you know, like Saudi Arabia, like basically it's a very, very, um, you know, affluent uh, focused um, uh, sport in my opinion. And, and rightfully so when you, tr when you're trying to build a car um, that's the fastest in the world, you need a lot of money. It, it's not just, you know, like you go to the dealership and you, you get a Porsche and that's it. Like it's a Ferrari that's like poured billions of dollars into it. And so there's like sponsorships you know, relationships, there's, um, you know, like ownership questions. I mean, if you watch Drive to Survive, I think you actually get a little bit of the taste of how rich this sport is and how rich the fans are. I think I said it one time, uh, I uh, estimate, I did some like research and it could be totally off, but like for an average like F1 fan, their sort of discretionary income is about thousand folds of an average basketball fan if that makes it, average NBA fans. So if that tells you anything about bankroll and, and how deep the pocket is, hopefully that, that gives the context. So so that's like sort of like my my take on like F1. And then why I got into F1 cards is, you know, Topps released their first Formula One card. Uh, it was the very first sort of production by a big manufacturer in, in the sport. I actually didn't know about it until a friend just like grabbed the case, just was breaking. And I was like, what? There's a Formula One 
you know, card set. And it was really cheap at the time. I mean, not, not like really cheap, but you could get either one box of like exquisite, you know, for 10K, or you could get an entire case of Topps Chrome Formula One flagship, like first year set for 6K, right? So it was just something that we're, we were always into. So husband, me, friends were into it. You just broke it open. Like not even like, oh, let's see what we can grade. It was just like literally for fun. We were just breaking it. Um, and then it caught fire. And I think that was roughly around summer of last year when I started to like really think about, okay. I mean, and the prices weren't moving in the first three to six months when, when the product released. It wasn't like immediately it came out and it was shooting up. So, you know, we were opening boxes here and there still because it was fun. Autos were fun. Then I went to the National and I saw that some of the very, very selective high-end collectors were talking about it. Um, and they were not putting it on their showcase. But, you know, got to talk to, for example, Austin from US Soccer Breaks, um, how rare this set is going to be. Not from just, hey, like, it's first year tops. Like, that's how cool it is. Formula One, it's a rich sport, whatever. But purely from, like, they did not produce enough of this to go around. Um, so just kind of, you know, added on to my, my confidence level that there, there is room for this to grow. Um, so went perhaps a little bit harder than I felt comfortable at the national in, in capturing cards. And, you know, like time just flew by and F1 is just peak. It's just peaking every single time. And, you know, I'm a natural conservative person sports cards is already a big risk, uh, you know, in my portfolio. And so I try to, you know, mitigate that by not taking too much risk in sports cards, but like every time it reaches a new high, I'm like, this is it. Like it, it has to calm down a little bit, you know, with anything, you know, if there's an up, there's a down, but we haven't but seen Hannah, that. But then Hannah, we just saw a, a record sale for the Futera, yes. Lewis Hamilton card. Right. Yes. And, and Cage was talking about that. We, we do a show, a daily show where we kind of, I don't want to call it plays. We do like kind of like CNBC fast money. Like, hey, if you're mm -hmm. looking at this stock, look at this one. Yeah. But with everyone buying like top <laughs> Sapphire, Lewis Hamilton, right? And it, he had like six different poses that look almost identical. <laughs> Cage said, well, take a look at his first card, which is Absolutely. the Futera. Yeah. What do you think about that sale? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know the buyer, the seller really well. I know the set really well. I had an opportunity to get a copy of that in a lower grade unfortunately the deal didn't go through and because when that Futera set first came out in 2006 80 percent of it went to the middle east you know uh shops or, or uh, consumers rest of it remained in japan and china it did not make to north america wow. and you know when and and half of those that went to the middle east if you've ever been there the the humidity and the temperature there is is disgusting the cards do not survive there if you do not keep it in a good condition, like, you know, condition sensitive places. So we are hypothesizing that half of it is either in the trash can because these are multi billionaires, right? Like they don't care about a card or they never lived through that sort of condition um, uh, in, in middle, middle East. And so in terms of like what's actually gradable out there for, two, for the 2006 Viterra, and this is Lewis Hamilton in his F2 uh, jersey or, or uh, driver's suit. So it's like a prospect card. Uh, there's not that many. Uh, there are certainly people out there who have, you know, two copies of it uh, and, and whatnot. And so they're extremely lucky, but I wouldn't say both are gradable, right? So given that sort of like, you know, understanding and knowledge of like how many are potentially out there, I, I mean, I knew that this card was going to be extremely, extremely sought after. Um, I think the bidding went, to be honest, like to be very, very honest, a little bit high. Um, it, perhaps two people really wanted it. Uh, two people with unlimited resource really wanted it, um, which is good for the two overall... people who two people who <laughs> think it's going to remain the highest graded for copy of it ever. Correct. It might not. There's very high chance that it will. Um, you know, PSA did a newsletter or like a blog about the PSA eight version of it when it mm -hmm. it was the first graded of the Futera um, as the highest graded, most sought after, etc. But a PSA nine did end up coming out. Um, it's funny how but, that happens, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of collecting, right, guys? Like, you don't. Or the ugly. It depends on what, which way you look at it. <laughs> that's true. You know what that's I mean? True. If PSA yeah. does an expose on an eight, all of a sudden somebody's like, I better go get that eight. And all of a sudden the nine materializes. Correct. You know, it happens. Yeah. And the eight's yeah. selling right now, right after the nine sold. Correct. Golden's got the eight right now on their premiere 
um, you know, auction that's currently up presently. And right. then when that so, one sells, yeah. they'll either be a seven, another eight, an eight and a half, a nine. They'll just materialize. This was not a I, rare. I, set. I think. I think. I, I think that's awesome. So that it 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 can be in the hands of many versus just one. Um, but who was I it? mean, Super Trout twenty seven. Is that who bought it? So, right. Was that Super Trout twenty seven? Yeah. Right. So yeah. so so he probably won't think it's awesome. I mean, he's probably a collector. Loves it. He's got great stuff on. Who knows? He might go get another one. Right. Well, um, maybe. I, I mean, I guess that's one way to is, do it. Yeah, um, he might go get all of it. Who knows? Um. <laughs> Unlimited resources, Cage. Did you not hear what Hannah said? Yeah. I mean, um. listen, that, that works. If you could do it that way, that works. So let me throw a couple things out there for you. Number one, um, you know, I have seen this before. So you are a, an exception in F1. And I don't want to go too crazy into F1 because there's way more of that. We might bore a lot. We need to discuss a lot of. No, 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 no. That's why you're here. But you, you, there's more to your collecting than just F1. But my thought on F1, and tell me where I'm wrong, is this, right? So you are in the minority. And what I mean by that is you watched F1 before the F1 cards came out. You watched F1 before the documentary came out. And I will hot take, clip this, whatever you want to say. I will go out on a limb, and it's not that far out on a limb, but I'll go out on a limb and say that half of the people holding F1 cards are not actual F1 fans. They are fans of making money on F1 cards. I didn't say 80%, which is what I think it actually is. I said 50%. And when that is the, 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 you know, the impetus for a lot of the motion on the cards, right? The collector base, the fan base is not huge in it, right? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a flipper base. It's a people who are investing in the cards. When you mix that with what is already happening with F1, and that is you went from that rare first release, that mm-hmm. 2009 Tops Round 1 release, that was a rookie for everybody. It was Anderson Silva and Randy Couture and George St. Pierre and BJ Penn was all their rookies. See what I did there? I made a comparison between F1 and UFC because the same thing happened back in 2009, a very low print run, cheap product that was primarily consumed by fans of that sport, which is the same thing that happened with the first Topps Chrome F1 release, the Dynasty stuff, you name right. it. But now what you're seeing is Sapphire, Batfire, Matfire, clearly Dunris is going to come out on top of it, and you name it, we're going to have Sage and Blage and, and Goldberg. And you're single-handedly hand, single cool. going to destroy so, clearly Dunris. That's so, your no, I'm, I'm getting a box of clearly done risk today. Football. Ian's very excited about opening it. So no, I'm not, I don't want to kill it. It's an, it's a reasonable price product that I can get and open, but you, I, I make a mockery of it, but you understand where I'm going. Yes. That now, if I want a Lewis Hamilton card standing there, looking all debonair in the exact same pose, I can get it in nine different releases. Now in the beginning, part of the price at discovery was if I was a Lewis Hamilton fan, I had to go and pay more for that one release. Mm-hmm. Then the Sapphire came out. Then the next year came out. Then another one. Then the one with the 70th on it, right? The 70 yeah. different. I mean, all, and then all, now they, they got a hit. They got a banger. It's Netflix. They're not stopping the printing presses. This is like 89 Upper Deck over here, right? It's just mm-hmm. it keeps on coming. And yeah. I think that negatively impacts you know, people's ability to flip. There's more of a supply, not of the first set. And I think that first set for tops might maintain some value because it is the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you layer on this little additional fun, right? Two things. One, as a sport in general, I understand the global phenomenon, but, but sports here, right? Hockey doesn't pick up, you know, it has a rabid fan base, but it doesn't pick up mainstream collectability because, you know, first of all, it's mostly Canadian, Right. You know, I mean, Austin Matthews is, is a U.S. born player who just scored 50 goals. But there's not that many of them. He's the first U.S. born player to do it since 97, 98 season. It just doesn't happen. It's more of a Canadian localized sport. Also, kids don't play it here. They pick up a basketball. They throw a football. They hit a tennis ball even the hell with it. Right. You know, they play baseball, play stickball. I can't go soccer. out as an eight year old soccer. I, I can't uh, a little bit, but not as much. Right. I mean, not 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 as much in the U.S. I mean, you you're a different bird, but we know that there was something wrong with you. You got dropped on your head a couple of times, but I can't go out and drive my car 200 miles an hour in my neighborhood when I'm eight years old. So it's a tough kind of like feeder sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can. I'd probably go to jail. But you, you could know, take your parents' I mean, car before social media existed. Remember that? That was fun. Yeah, yeah, you could. You definitely could. But so so I mean, point being that. You combine that with the, you know, the multitude of stuff that's there. And then this one, which is a little bit of a wrinkle. I want to get your expert opinion on this, right? It's, there's not a rookie crop that comes in every year. 
So in mm-hmm. addition to the mass production of all of these cards, right, in addition to the fact that there's just release after release after release coming out of this stuff, there's also not a churn, right? There's not a, hey, mm-hmm. this year's tops has has um, has the rookie of Wander Franco. Sure. And, you know, last year we had, you know, all of these guys and that we're waiting for Dominguez and we have all these new things. Basketball has a rookie class every year. It goes from Luca to LaMelo to Cade Cunningham, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Zion and blah, blah, blah. You know, I can't believe I skipped Zion. <laughs> so there may be one or two driver changes in yeah. F1 season to season, mm-hmm. right? So you got the same checklist in F1 over and over again. Mm-hmm. So when you combine all that, any nervousness about, you know, these releases, people putting their money in it? Did I just make you nervous? <laughs> no, she leaned no. in. She's about to let you have it. I, uh, oh, that's why she's here. That's why she's here. <laughs> Hannah, don't hold back on him. He's a bully. Sometimes. Yeah, don't hold back. Let's, I'm not okay. being a bully. I'm asking. I really want to know. Everyone can have right. their own opinion. You know what I mean? That's so, true. This is that. true. Um, you know, those are all very, very valid points. Um, and that's the devil's advocate that everyone should be playing when they are getting into anything, you know? And so those are valid points, but to kind of back it up and, and share my thoughts on it. One, the the, flag, the 2020 set is going to be goaded no matter what. Like, and I think you and I agree on that. Like it's the first year set. There's only three. So there's Dynasty, which is the on-card auto with patch. And then there's the Tops Chrome and Tops Sapphire. That's it, right? And then in it, yes, there are out of 99, out of 50 golds, out of 25 orange, out of 10 purple, et cetera, out of five red supers and, and paparashas and, and stuff like that. I, I think that's that's definitely not a lot of variations and, and parallels um, considering any other releases by Tops and Panini. Now, the second year blew my mind, the 2021, because we've seen how much run that F1 sports cards had. And if I am a Tops executive, I'm going to print the crap out of it, right, in the years to come that I can milk it. Like, absolutely. And so no surprise, this year they released Tops, so regular paper. They did Mega. They did, you know, Blasters. They're doing Hobby. They're doing Light Boxes where it's like a Hobby Box, but there's no Auto. Now there's going to be Sapphire where I don't know if it's going to be Sapphire Light, Sapphire Hobby. They'll be doing Dynasty again. But even like, so the 2020 ones that really surprised me, I only did two pre-orders of the cases just because, you know, I thought maybe I could, because uh, to get kind of specific here, Alonso, who is a two-time world champion, was not in the 2020 set because he didn't drive in 2019. He retired, he came back. And so he's now in the 2021 set. So he's definitely one of the chasers for the 2021 set because he's a two-time world champion already. Uh, It's his first card. Uh, modern card. He does have other um, rookie cards. So like there's some alpha of- for you guys listening. Fernando Alonso, right? Is it yeah. is uh, a little bit yeah. of alpha there, guys? Yeah. Luca Nation, you guys listening first? A little bit of uh, a little insight there for you guys. Um, so yeah, I mean, but when when and that's the key difference is F1 still. You say fifty percent might be in it for the money first before the sport. Maybe, but my take is actually because I, I feel this on a daily basis where I interact with other folks who are who are you know into the card. More than half is actually not in the US still. Folks who are opening 2021 20, products, they're out in the UK, they're out in Hong Kong, they're opening 20 cases in Taiwan today, just like people getting together and they're just breaking it. And what you really need is not people. I mean, it doesn't matter if people come in for the money. I mean, the money is is, is a nice byproduct. Oh, nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, people right. people do this to make money. I get that, but, you know. Yeah, but not, I mean, I get that. your concern in that. So, if they don't start, if they stop making money, would they just leave and hence creating sort of like a shock in the market? Very well. I mean, I think that's necessary at this point. Like the cases okay. for this year went from. Five six k at pre order. It's now sitting at thirteen fourteen k in two weeks time. Like that's not healthy at all, yep. right? So, yep. you know, when I get messages like, "Hey, I found this case for thirteen point five because fourteen is the market price. Should I buy it?" Yep. I'm like, I mean, take it at your own risk. But I wouldn't buy that, right? Like, right. I, I really think that it's gone. But that's the flip side. Too, too fast. You made a great point, right? So now someone like you who didn't know it was there, and then oh well, let me get a case. A fan who was in Austin, you know, watching it with your husband, you know, the who watched the Netflix show. You were actually at events. You were the one they catered to in the beginning. You were able to open the product, and now people like you who might not be as well off or who might not be as well connected, 
they can't get the third product. They can't buy the stuff. And I guess, you know, give Tops credit then, that's maybe that's why they came out with light. Yeah. Right? But, it, you know, some people don't want to buy light. You know, they got yeah. the 19, they got the 20 product. I mean, they got the 2020 product. They got the 2021. And now they're like, I can't get the 2022. I believe that is, uh, by the way, that, ha- that happens. Yeah. Like that happens in, in these sports. It happens in the fringe sports. It happens in, in all of these things, right? Yeah. You know, it's why, you know, the Upper Deck Golf Artifacts box was $1,000, even though it was garbage in it, right? It's, it's the reason, you know, when there's money to be made and there's people who are after it, um, this is what happens. And I think, you know, you're being very, you know, forthcoming with it. You're being very honest with it. And if you're telling people kind of like, you know, you know, proceed with caution. If you love it, go right ahead and buy it. But at 13, five, 14,000, you know, there's reason to pump the brakes a little bit. That's smart. I mean, at, at base, you don't want your fan base there. You don't want the people who actually love F1 to get burned Absolutely buying not. these cards and Absolutely losing not. money. Cause then you lose them. Right. Exactly. And like, honestly, like the, the kind of main point of view that I want to, I want to cast out there is, Yes, absolutely. The prices have gone too high for an average collector who, who maybe it's their first F1 card to get in it with, with ease, right? So, you know, if you all, if you just want to get into touch and get a, get a taste of F1, get a card like, you know, I, I say like get like a base or a refractor of a portrait driver and see how it goes, right? Like not really looking at as it as an opportunity to like make a ton of money, but rather it's just an entry point and like I say that there's nothing better to better way to like learn something than like putting a little bit of your own money in it and then getting invested in it. Like you now go watch the races. You may now go look up like, you know, videos about the driver or whatnot. So as an entry point, 2021 product, very decently priced at singles, I think, you know, under a thousand dollars, which is ridiculous to say at raw, but you know, just get into something, maybe a color of a portrait, see, see what it's like. For example, right now, Ferrari doing amazing. I would, you know, go buy a Carlos signs, you know, if I like Ferrari and see and, and get a taste of the sport before going out and spending 10, 20, 30 K on, you know, first year set or an autograph of, of a card something like that. Um, so I, I would be cautious. I mean, it's at all time high all the time and it's scary. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm thankful yeah. f- that it's growing, but when there's no breaks, you know, you do feel a little bit worried and scared about it. Yeah. A big debate we have, or a big debate I think the hobby has, is like collectors versus flippers versus investors. And I'm curious, you kind of your you know point of view on this, Hannah, because you know if you go through your Instagram page, you have some beautiful cards, and I love how you mix it modern with like I think you have like a 1984 um, F1 card you just picked up. I can't say his name, but where, where do you stand? Right? Are you in the? Are you trying to make money? Is it that you love these guys and love the sport? And if the, it goes up in price, great. If it doesn't, help us. Because it's like a big debate, right? Collectors are like, this is a hobby for collectors, right? Yeah. But then at the end of the day, if there's no money to be made, you lose a lot of flippers and investors. And what do the collectors even have to collect, right? So I'm curious your thoughts on this, uh, yeah. if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I would be lying if I say I am like all collector and like I will stay even if all these turn into paper money. I mean, the, the reality for me right now is why I'm still around and I'm still passionate about this is actually the chase of it, um, which is interesting to say. But like I've gotten so deep, especially in like some of the emerging markets now that the the joy and just the the incredible feeling you get in being able to source a card that perhaps is not available today and it doesn't even have to be about like the value of the card actually like there could be some rare like you know like 84 Senna card that's sitting somewhere in like a small town Portugal that I'm able to like somehow get a touch of that or um, be able to you know like be a connector for a friend to to get the card etc like that's what like really excites me is that that's like the true sort of passion for collection is to is to find something rare right and whether you keep it or you sell it that that's your decision but like it's the joy of finding something like that gold mining treasure hunting attitude about it right that i really am hooked on right now Um, well listen i'm gonna i'm gonna send you on a hunt you gotta find some nikki lauda cards for me i got that's what you gotta do you gotta find some i gotta send you nikki lauda yeah uh there's another really cool card it's it like last sold for like two hundred dollars which I think mm-hmm. is absolutely bonkers. It's actually an image of his accident, like on a oh, card. Oh wow! Yeah, 
and I've been trying to look for that everywhere because I mean, while as distraught as the event was, was that the Fleer was a seventy was seventy four was a Fleer no, one. It was, or? it was a very like it, it's. I, I forget the manufacturer's name, but it wasn't a well known one. Um, but so I've seen those. I also gave a uh, uh, Miles. You know the oh, yeah. uh, the Le Mans guy. I gave that as a play once also. But Nicky Lauda, I identify with Nicky Lauda because you know he's got a rivalry with a pretty boy Hunt, mm-hmm. just like my pretty boy co-host here. You know I'm the <laughs> ugly one with the talent, like Nicky Lauda. You know so we have this like Hunt Lauda rivalry going on in the show here a little bit. But let's not <laughs> pigeonhole you, right? She also collects. She's a LeBron fan, just like Andrew. Andrew loves yeah. LeBron. No. Yes, yeah, she, and she's got two black black refractors. One no, I I, oh, traded one for, I I traded one for a Max for stopping card. Yeah, Hunt versus Lauda, yes. one of the one of F one's greatest rivalries. BBC, this is a must watch. Absolutely, all right, absolutely, all right. Need to go Dude, they actually have stuff, a movie man. about this, so you should go watch it. Yeah, Hunt versus Lauda, and Andrew, I'll let you take it home with this. She collects Hannah. I can tell you why she is a Liverpool fan. Because Liverpool's goaded. <laughs> Wait. Soccer collects a little bit of soccer. I do. Andrew knows soccer. He played soccer. But this is well, one I, of the I was players leave. on. Go ahead. Go for no, it. No, you man. go, Cage. Okay. Finish this. Finish your statement because I'm curious if you're joking or not. Sometimes I don't know. You have a great. <laughs> yeah, I, I am can't read him right now. <laughs> I I am not joking. Isn't one of the um one of the better players for the South Korean national team on Hot Tottenham? Sure. Not freaking Liverpool. On Tottenham. No, Tottenham. Tottenham. What? I said Liverpool. It's He's on Tottenham. Tottenham. My bad. I don't know She's soccer. I, I thought you were kidding, Peach. I thought you were no, kidding. No, 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 no. No, I listen. The <laughs> only team I page. know, <laughs> the only team I know in soccer is is Barca. Good thing to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I I went through your collection. I went through. I started looking at it. I'm not going to try to say this guy's name, but it's like Sun Hung Min. Min. Yeah. I said yeah. It okay. But what I like about him is he's improved every year, right? There's been a few Absolutely. kind of uh, South Korean and Japanese players that come and go. He has yeah. lasting power, and he's gotten better and better and better, which is cool. Yeah. So, Any so he doesn't play. He doesn't play for Bayern Munich. I had the team wrong. <laughs> he's just not so good. He's just mute not. him. <laughs> mute him. Right. Mute. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about World Cup, though. Who are you? Who's your chase for the World Cup? And by the way, Naderade, if you're listening, not my words, Naderade. Hannah said that the climate in the Middle East is actually different than the climate in America, and it might have an impact on the World Cup. So it, Hannah's words, not mine. They got they, good they, air conditioning. They freaking changed the, the timing of World Cup for, for that. You know what I mean? It must be bad. You know what I mean? Well, well, I said to our audience that if you go back and you look at the World Cups, <laughs> World Cup's not on European soil. European teams struggle. And when mm-hmm. the World Cup is on European soil, they do well. And for some reason, that raised a lot of backlash from our community. And they were like researching like the stadiums and like the air conditioning and all that stuff. But anyway, who are you chasing or who are you excited for as uh, the World Cup approaches? Which, guys, is in six months, it's going to be here before you know she, it. She already answered this question. She's rooting for France because she's a Ronaldo fan. Mute Cage right now. <laughs> <It's> mute <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm taking it too far. <laughs> oh, he self muted himself. Great. Um <laughs> so it's tomorrow, I believe, or tonight that they um draw up the teams, right? For quality. Yep, oh, World so Cup draw. Wait. Absolutely. I can't wait. Um I mean I'm I'm personally rooting that South Korea at least makes to the sixteenth round. I mean that that's like my expectation. Um but in terms of like cards and like who I am like really keen on this year to make World Cup plays for is definitely Mbappe. Um, France, you know, they're they're I think going to be great uh, for different reasons. But Mbappe cards have taken quite a bit of a dip in the last year or so. Um, so that's my play. Uh, and in the World Cup, I have France winning it all as well. Might have done something in Vegas last weekend a little bit uh, to nice. put, to put money where my mouth is, um, but yeah, it's because of Pogba, not Mbappe. But anyway, so listen, here's the yeah. deal, right? We're bringing it right back. He still plays for France, right? He didn't leave and go play for. He's, he's a, still Pogba's okay. got so much talent. When he's on, Pogba is on. Yeah, he's got cool hair too. But so yeah. taking it back to where we go, right? You started this off by saying about a you know year and a half ago. 
you didn't see any women in the hobby basically, right? It was just one of those things where it just, you know, it was odd. You bring it to Mint Collective where, you know, a week ago we just were there. And, it, you know, I saw Black Jaded Wolf, who we've had yes. on our show also, took a picture and it was, you, you, you almost couldn't fit everybody in the picture. Um, you know, where do you see that going in the next year, continue to expand? And then what, if you had an ask of the hobby, right? What could we all do? to help foster that what what can we do to to, to make that happen if, if it was going to happen in a year double the size yeah. how could we get it done in six months you know yeah. what, I mean? what can we as a hobby do for sure um so to answer your first question like we're not we're just getting started and i really see the growth and a lot of the new faces i saw at mint they were industry leaders coming in for example you know like alt just hired a female for their like head of um like I think operations or something like that. There's also Adriana at Alt, who's head of marketing. Um, Julie, head of partnerships at One Knot. I mean, Black Jaded Wolf. Like, I mean, Ty, like, I mean, a ton of shop owners, a ton of breaking company owners. And so I think we'll see more of it come out actually as more institutions come into, you know, sort of the, the wildlife of the hobby, I think. Um, and while they may not have been a collector first, they're definitely sports fans. And one of the big key takeaway, and I don't know if you guys you know, saw this as well from the Mint Collective was there were enough sort of momentum from core companies who basically said, we're not gonna go, we're not gonna focus on going deeper in the existing collector's pockets, but we're going to go out to the ridiculous amount of sports fanatics out there and bring them into this amazing journey of the hobby, right? And so as we see that, and there's a ton of women sports fans, right? Like regardless of like whatever category of the sport. So when we see that happen, um, and then also when we talk about non-sports, you know, with, with right. uh, Zero Cool, I think there's a ton of opportunity for female just card collectors to come in. Oh, we get obsessed, you know, we, we get more obsessed <laughs> than guys probably in a lot of different ways. Like, when you bring out like, you know, a Beyonce set of cards, I'm pretty sure that that itself will bring like 10 million women into trading cards. Um, so I think we're just getting started. We'll definitely see more women at these big events and also just on digital platforms being more vocal, which is incredible. Um, and to help to, to answer your second question, I think what I ask the hobby every time is, and, and the folks that I meet on a daily, daily basis is, like be a be an advocate for it, not just to, you know, your buddies like that you grab a beer with or whatever, but like your wife, your girlfriend, your you know daughters, your cousins, girl cousins, like whatever it is, right? Like I mean, regardless of gender, whatever, just be an advocate for it, which actually goes miles because when you actually talk to everyone, like ask them like how you got in, there's always a connecting part. There's a thread, right? Someone already in the hobby pulled you in, right? Most of the time, so. I think that's the best way to go about this is to bring how 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 do we bring more diversity into the hobby? Talk to the people that you talk to on a daily about you know how you spend your time outside of work, outside of you know your day to day, and like be an evangelist uh, of you know the hobby that we love. Then that'll automatically I think bring more diversity, equity, and, and inclusion into the hobby. I gotta give Manny some uh, some love and a shout out here. I mean, he brought his wife to Mint, right? And she's not a collector. But she kind of left with at least like a, a seed planted. Hmm, this there is kind of interesting. This is fun, yeah. right? So even something so subtle, so little like that. Absolutely. I got to tell you, I, I was excited to have this 10 for 10, Women of the Hobby. Uh, I'm more excited after the conversation with you. So, Hannah, I appreciate it. Wow. So you guys aren't following I'm apologizing your... in advance, by the way. I'm apologizing to the next nine guests because she took my crap about F1 cards <laughs> and turned it all around. She, I, my jokes about uh, soccer and told you to mute me. I mean, this, you know, I mean, well done. Well done. I mean, they, you know, there have been many 600 and something episodes here. I mean, well, well done. I like it. I like it. You Thank held you. up well under cross examination. I know. Tell everybody where they can follow For like the three people in our audience that don't follow you, could you let people know about your Instagram and also your YouTube? Because I think it's both are must follow, must subscribe. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube um, under She Collects Cards. That's that's my uh, alternative uh, space that I live in. Um, and we'll definitely follow back. I love it. 
Thank you, Hannah. I appreciate Thanks, that. Everybody. I hope we could have you back on the show. I hope people from the audience reach out, follow, send you DMs because, you know, we're hitting record numbers on listens on YouTube and Spotify, Apple, but we can't answer a lot of the F1 questions. We can't answer some of the soccer market yeah, send questions. Them, send them send them, my way. I'll, I'll be more than happy to engage and just have a discussion and conversation. And nobody reach out about that Nikki Lauda card. I'm getting it from her. I'm working a trade. Don't try to steal that out from under me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Take care. Thank everybody. you, Hannah. Bye, Luca Nation. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks.